can also close the door. Okay, so back during the quake days, I sent an email to all of you saying, hey guys, you know, for lots of time now, since you can't be in the lab, it's a good time to actually do some writing because there's nothing much else to do. I'm not sure how much you actually took that suggestion on board. Well, maybe some of you did. I know some of them have been frantically working on a PhD thesis. <laughs> Uh, I'm not too sure about the others. Sometimes some of them weren't even here yet. Um, but um, yeah, so I wanted to follow up on that. And um, um, since I assume that you've all been writing and that you've got something to write on right now, then maybe um, this would be useful to talk about a bit how you can make that very efficient and effective. Because of course, it's a quite uh, it, it's a lot of work to do this. And um, um, so I will like today introduce you to a couple of things that will make this process a little bit easier. Um, and uh, the tricky part here is that some of you will probably be quite familiar with the things I want to talk about. So I just want to have like a quick raise of hand. Who's usually micro using Microsoft Word to do writing? Who's using LaTeX to do writing? One, excellent. And who's using a bibliographic manager, such as EndNote or anything like that? One, two, three, okay, excellent. Wow, so my effort will not be completely wasted. Hi there. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is, is three things. Uh, first is the, the process of writing, the writing itself. The second thing is the, is the process of layouting in terms of getting into a format that is publishable. And last, it's the process of actually the publishing process, so when it comes to submission review and, and so forth. And maybe uh, one or two hints for uh, sort of career advice, if you might say so. So let's kick off with um, some um, um, with some writing. Now, what you see is that I'm going to show you today a lot of hands-on things. So. Um, There'll be a lot of demonstrations so that you can actually see you know really well how all of these things are done right and um, one could possibly argue that Microsoft Word might not be the best text editor there is and, and you know it has certainly some problems but it's also not the worst one it has qu actually quite a few um, things that are quite nice in it and that help you to to write actually you might not necessarily want to put a hundred figures in there but you know, at least for processing text, pure text, it's reasonably okay. So this is probably how you start writing with an empty page, right? And then usually you have got a, a big problem now, and that is you have to do two things at the same time. One is that you have to think about what is it that you want to write about, and you have to decide in which order you should write these things. And these are if you try to do both at the same time, it's very difficult. So it's usually a good idea to take one step at a time. And the good way to do this is to first, just to blur out everything that you want to talk about. And, um, well, this doesn't necessarily need to be very unstructured. One can already try to use a little bit of a structure in there. And a good way of doing this is to use the outline feature of Microsoft Word. So who of you has ever used the outline feature of Microsoft Word? One. Excellent. See, this is so wonderful. You know, everybody's using Word, but nobody actually knows how it works. Wonderful. Now, so the outline feature of Microsoft Word is a little tool. It's, it's, it's just one of the different views that Word is offering. Um, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And it's just <clears throat> right here. You know, you've got a draft, the web layout, I'm not sure whoever uses the web layout. Um, but there's the outline tool. And this is a pretty good tool. So what you can do is say, okay, I'm probably going to do an introduction. All right? Okay, and in there I want to talk about um, uh, the need for this technology. All right? And then I want to talk about, you know, all this, this great researcher who. Uh, who did this piece of work. And then maybe I'll probably gonna have something maybe like a, a research question. Maybe then I have a method section. 
and maybe an event. Oh, that may be something like a like a result. Something like this, maybe, right? Um, but then I figure, okay, you know, um, actually this is not really good. What I what I should really start with is is um, introducing the problem, right? And actually, this is this is a real big issue because it actually has sub things like uh, state of the art and um, uh, my contribution and so forth, right? And the nice things you can do now is you can just move these things around. That's the nice thing. So, for example, you can uh, increase or decrease the levels. But, for example, uh, you can also move it up and down, which is here. So you can change the order of things. So this way you can nicely create sort of like an informal hierarchy about how things should come together. Right? And you can really just start blurping everything out, you know, clustering it in some sort of hierarchies. And then once you've blurred everything out, you can actually then start to structure it even more so. So that in the end, you sort of come to a good structure. Now, the nice thing about this now is that, of course, you shouldn't start actually writing the real text in here. This is really just for the structure of your document, not for the text itself. But once you're satisfied with your structure, you can just switch over to the draft thing. And what you see here is that now all of these things have become your actual headlines, right? So this is a headline one, heading two, this is heading two. Um, do we already have a This is heading three, right? So and now you can start actually writing in the normal text. This is what I want to say, right? Now, so you first create the outline, the structure of the document, and then you start putting the meat onto the skeleton. No? Now, what I said now in terms of the styles is actually something very, very uh, important because you should actually never ever do anything without styles in Microsoft Word. So who of you has ever been using styles? All of you, that's really good. Um, ah, they have been now kind of hiding these things. Um, I'm still trying to get used to Microsoft Office 2011. Hmm. Well, essentially the basic idea is that you, that the, the idea of a style is that you define as it says, a style, for example, here now for the flow text. Um, but maybe, ah, I think I know where it is. Oh, not necessarily. So, but the idea is that what you can do now, once you did everything with styles, is that if you want, for example, you don't want this to be blue, you know, since Microsoft 10 and 11, everything got blue. Um, I don't want blue, I want it black, because that's, you know, a much higher contrast. And if you apply this, then all, every text that has the style is changed automatically. So the point is you change it only once, and all the text that is in the style will be changed. If you would do this manually, well, it's really painful, because you would have to find every headline and change it every single time. And then automatically, you probably use some inconsistencies. Really bad idea. So work with styles to define how things look. There shall not be a single piece of text in your document without a style. Okay. Now, next is of course, uh, which is really, really useful, is once you have the styles, you can even do things with it. And one of the things you can do with it is to make, for example, um, a table of contents. So who's ever done a table of contents? All of you. So I'm going to make this really quick. Um, you just go to the index. You want to have a table of contents. You maybe do the traditional way. No, classic's better. Whoosh. There you go. And of course the table of contents is based on your styles. The styles define the uh, essentially the headings. The headings are then now in the table of contents. Right. Of course the same thing holds true with... Uh, well, we'll come to that next. So this is something nice about styles. Um, in general, when you have um, um, papers, stereotypically in this department, you'll probably end up with two types of problems. There's more of a technology paper and there's more of a psychology paper. 
in a technology paper, probably what you're going to have is introduction. You're going to have a problem definition. In this problem definition, you actually probably have some requirements. So you start your text with, hey, you know, maybe a little bit of introduction. So in this recent area, this and this became more important, and therefore, therefore, we have to pay more attention to this and that. But this question has not been answered, or this, you know, there's something that's not quite right. Therefore, we want to have a solution, and then we want to define requirements. That means um, um, I will consider essentially my contribution to success if, if these and these and these requirements are being met. Then you probably dig into some literature. You would say, that, okay, what else is out there? Who else has tackled this this problem? You know, and why are all these other solutions not exactly the one thing that I'm looking at? Also, you know, you can do benchmarking against that. You know, um, and then you probably start to describe your system. Um, and once you've described your system in terms of how it works, you probably come to an evaluation part where you say, okay, now we know how it works. Let's see how well it actually performs. And there are two types. I mean, the one thing is you can actually check back against the requirements. So if you have a list of requirements, you would then say, okay, you know, these were the requirements, one, two, three, four, five, and look how I met them, check, 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 check. And since I met all my requirements, my system must be good. That's one way of doing it. Um, another way of doing it is, is that you would actually have a comparison. So for example, you would have an existing system. That might be either an earlier version of your own system, or it might be somebody else's system. And then you would have some sort of parameters that you measure that determine your success. And then you would show, look, this is solution A, solution B, solution B works better, so we go for that one. And then you sort of like summarize the whole thing in the conclusions, and then you're done. This is sort of like a rough argumentation pattern that you will very often see in technology papers. When it comes to psychology paper, it's slightly different because there the emphasis is not really on proposing a new kind of technology, but it's actually to answer a question. So what you would do is you would Again, start with introduction, you know, where this field is becoming increasingly important, you know, these are the social problems around it, lots of work has been done, but unfortunately this little piece has not yet been done, or has been done insufficiently, so we actually have to ask this kind of question. And then you would sort of like list your research questions. After that, you would then go and see in literature who else has done things related to this work, and why is all this work that has been done before not exactly the answer to your question. You would then define a method, and this method is, of course, is targeted towards actually answering those research questions. Um, and once you've described the method in full-fledged, you would then actually show the, the results of, of, the, of the test and draw some conclusions. And of course, the, conclu the results should actually you know, be able to give you the answer of your questions. There's only one possible failure here, and it's not, you know, for example, if have two systems and you wish that system A would have be better because that's maybe the one that you've been working on but unfortunately it's been shown not to be better that is also still the result the only failure that there is is if you're not able to answer the question if the, uh, result, if the results of your experiment does not allow you to answer the question for example is, is B better than A that's the only failure if it's just unfortunate that your system doesn't show up to be better than an existing system, well, then the experiment still worked. You know, it's not what you would have hoped for, but it's still a success. And the success is that at least you can sort of like help people to avoid, uh, help people to make the same mistakes you did. So if you made a system and it just shows up, it's not any better than one you had before, then it's also still good. Because if you publish that, you know, the next person who has to decide what he wants to do knows, okay, this one didn't work. Of course, it's not so good for the prestige because, you know, we all want to be proud of what we've done and we always want to show that what we've done is better than anybody else's. Uh, but, you know, it's quite all right. You know, we don't have to be, you know, perfect. Okay, now, you've seen these two types of papers and... Um, um, That's not the one. Um, let's see where I threw that one. Um, yeah. So this is what you see is, is probably you know the typical outline of, of a of a let's say psychology paper. You know, in the method section we'd have manipulation, measurements, procedures, setup, participants, and so forth. This is kind of like the stereotypical one. This is what we'll be actually be working on. 
Um, was I smart? Yeah, I was reasonably smart. Okay. Now, so what I did now, I filled this in with some dummy text. I actually haven't written a paper here. I've just put some random English in there so it looks like a reasonable paper. And um, the first thing I want to show you is, is, is something that is kind of important. That is, you know, I was saying you should work with styles. There's also a style for um, essentially for figures and for tables. Who's ever worked with that? Captions? You all work with it very good. So if we do it very quickly, the idea is that you can just um, insert a caption and you say it's figure one and you would say it's uh, show me. And the nice thing is that you can then do a cross reference that you can say um, only table number. You can make a uh, a cross reference, right? So you can see, um, see, figure one. And then, on, based on that, you can then also do an index of figures and an index of tables. And the nice thing is, of course, that this updates automatically. So if you add now a new figure before it, all the numbering will be done automatically. So you don't have to do it manually because that would drive you crazy. But since we've all done it, well, right now we're gonna take it a little bit easy on this one. Now. The next thing is probably when you write your introduction is that you of course have to use lots and lots and lots of references, right? And I've seen only one or two hands that showed up when I said reference manager, right? Is that correct? Okay. So what you might have done, you might have done it manually, like you would have like, if you do, for example, the IEEE standard, you would have done like something like this, you know, okay, paper number one, and then you would go to the end, you know, make a one, and then you would put these things in there really, really painful, particularly if you, you change the order. I mean, if you make now a new reference before that, you know, and the numbering, you have, to, you have to change every number again, right? This is real suicide. You really don't want to do that. So what you're, of course, going to use is you're going to use a reference manager. And one of the ones that's actually being provided by this university is EndNote. EndNote is a little bit of, uh, let's say, uh, well, it's the most often used, I would say. There are the reference manager. Uh, the irony is that the company um, um, who owns EndNote is uh, Thomson Reuter, and Thomson Reuter has actually bought all of the commercial packages. So they have like three or four different reference manager, and they, you know, they give you a choice. But really, it's all the same company, so it doesn't really matter. Um, there are free tools available as well. Um, and um, yeah, why don't we go into that one? So this one is, comes for free from the university. Here's the web address where you can just download from Mac and for Windows, latest versions. Um, um, that's kind of really nice. It's a very good tool, and we're going to use that in, uh, in a little bit. Um, something else that you can consider using if, like, if you prefer to do it, um, uh, let's say, uh, of three, is um, Zutero. And the nice thing about Zutero is that it's actually a Firefox plugin. And the idea is the following. Um, if you sort of look for references, you probably work on the web. You know, you go to Google Scholar, or you go to some other literature search engines, and you already work on the web, right? So why not also use them, you know, store these kind of things inside, you know, the browser? So what it does is actually has a little database attached to it, and then, you know, all the references essentially go into uh, a little panel, which would be in the bottom here, and, and then it works. The nice thing about Zupiter is also that it has, uh, the problem is, of course, now, this kind of, there are quite a few of those packages that sort of a little database programs, essentially, always. But then the tricky part is that you want the next step, and the next step is the integration of this into your writing environment. So if you would do that with BIP, I mean, if you would do a pure lady guy, you know, you could get around it, because you can just export a text file and you're done. But if you want to have something more comfortable, you probably want to have a plugin that goes into Microsoft Word, for example, so that you can actually access functionality inside of Microsoft Word. Zutero is one of those that actually provides such a plugin. So there's a Word plugin from Zutero that will allow you to insert your references directly into Word, which is nice. Yes. All of these, all the reference managers allow you to export 
uh, into a bib tag is, uh, for explanation is nothing else than a, a certain format of references and they're stored in a very simple text file and this is something like the most basic thing and all of them can do it so it's not really a problem um, other things that are pretty nice is um, um, if you are a Mac user then uh, this thing is really nice it's called papers and it's kind of like iTunes for PDF files it's really really sweet um, it's really comfortable it's very well done it's really excellent the only thing is that the last time I actually uh, looked at it it didn't have a word plugin so in that sense you then have to make a little bit of a workaround to get these citations into your into your word document nevertheless it might have been changed by now I mean uh, I'm not sure these things keep on changing very quickly um, but essentially it's really nice it's not just actually a, a manager for your references mm -hmm. But it's actually your own little library. So you actually store your PDF files in there. Because when you kind of like download all this literature, you, 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 are, you must keep the PDF file somewhere, you know. And this one is a good place where you can keep it. EndNote also allows you to make a connection to your PDF file. They recently integrated that functionality as well. But definitely not as smooth as, as, as papers. Now, uh, but that actually costs money. So... Another free one is something that you can use is um, Mendeley. So the idea is, in general, why would you store all this information on your local computer when you can just store all this information actually in an online system, right? And there are quite a few of them. Uh, now, Mendeley is one of them, which is reasonably nice. Um, there are also other ones. Um, um, the one thing that I've been using also quite a bit is site you like, uh, mainly because it is really, really efficient. Um, it's a really good system. Um, now, so here you've got some sort of like alternative systems that allow you to have a little database about your references, and you really, really should use it. Now, but see. This database is all nice and good, but then the question is, well, how on earth are you actually going to get your references into such a database? Right? So, um, what, what something that you might be doing is that you go to Scholar. Um, who is not using Scholar? Oh, interesting. Um, so, who should we search for? Mark? Let's see. Um, so here's some stuff he, he published. Uh, lots of ads, for example. Well, let's go for this one. The nice thing is that these days that a lot of the publishers actually make the citations available to you on their web page. Because you don't want to copy and paste. You don't want to copy the title, copy and paste the title into the field, the author into the field. That's really a lot of work. You really don't want that. So what you can do is actually you can just, for example, here, you can just download the citation. Um, Wonderful. Interesting. So much for open access. Yeah. Yeah, uh, ACM has some other problems. That's why I didn't want to do ACM. Come on, this one maybe? Jesus, that's bad. Okay. Um, okay, then let's do ICM. So what you can see here is, an, is, is the export function. If you hit on X EndNote, you see uh, the EndNote. And you see it's always just a little text file. And you hit the, uh, the download. There you go. And then you go to EndNote. You go to File, Import. Uh, here's the file. You import it. And there you go. And here you got a little speciality of of, uh, of ACM, they turned around the names, which is really useless. So we have to correct this a little bit. Okay, so now we got this thing in our um, in our database, so to speak. 
And now we can actually use this in, in, our, in our Word document. So if I want to now cite this paper, the only thing I have to do, I hit the search button, I check for mark, there it is, and there we go. Now, interesting. Um, so let's do... Okay, this is a good thing when we come to this. As you know, there are a lot of different styles of how, how you should actually format your, your bibliography. And one of the most common ones that we use is APA, the American Psychological Association. Uh, that's a very common one. The, the number to IEEE is also very common. But these are kind of styles. Now, the nice thing is that um, um, EndNote comes with a huge database of all kinds of styles. You don't actually have to define it. Or in the worst case scenario, you can actually uh, and it has an online repository where there are even more styles. So you never actually have to do the formatting yourself. Now, there we go. So here is the, um, the paper. And then also, in the end, you see the reference. Right? Um, so let's, let's throw in another one, just for the heck of it. Who should we search for? Oh, that's the easy solution. Let's look what Christina has done. Ne? Dicke? Uh, uh, Christina, sorry. So, no, oh, there we go. So, we're going to download this thing. And then we're going to import it. Could be, uh, but to be honest, it's a little bit tricky. It's not always, I, um, yeah. Hmm. The one from ACM is a bit tricky, so I, I usually prefer the, uh, still the manual way, because sometimes um, you still have to select, in the, the they're so stupid here that uh, you have to select the right import type here, otherwise the import goes wrong. So if it would be set to uh, an RIS, then it would not import. And it doesn't automatically detect it. How smart is that? In any case, so we got Christina in here. And now we can also um, add Christina to here. OK. So we just search for it, throw it in. And the nice thing is that it automatically combines these two things together, which is really nice. It puts the, the, uh, the, the, the citation in here. And then, for example, if we uh, don't want this style, actually we want to have, let's say, uh, I triple. Uh, um, what else do we want? Um, let's see, is there anything we know? Plant and soil. OK, let's do, just do Chicago. OK, not sure if this is how that is different, but we'll see. Well, it's not so different. Um, that's usually also a numbered one, which is kind of nice, which kind of like shows the uh, total by year. Well, let's see what we get. The reason now here is that, um, well, every single time it will be different. But the reason why this is this way is right now that um, there are so many styles out there, like thousands of them. If you would all load them in the, at the startup, it would be really slow. So these days, all of these things are parked in another directory. So if you want them, um, I can show you where they are. It is just in um, um, uh, in here. You would have the styles, and and here are the ones that are right now. Right, those are the ones that are active right now. And if I'm not mistaken, there's also one with, uh, with even more. No, not sure. But well, what they did they actually, the University of Canterbury cut them out because this is the University of Canterbury version of it. But you can always just get them directly from 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 EndNote. So um, if we look at EndNote and support services, 
we have some uh, output styles. So we want to have, let's say, IEEE. There you go. Right. So you can always just download the style, dump it into the directory, and you have it. Now, the one thing that is, of course, important uh, is one other thing. Uh, let's see, actually, if we um, have this one in here. Interesting. We don't have bib bibtech. This is uh, so. I just installed this today, <laughs> so uh, on this computer because it's a new computer. Um, that's why this is not done right, because this will be important now. The nice thing is that actually uh, EndNote also allows you to do uh, to do BibTeX, which is the next step that we go over to LaTeX. That is correct, that is correct. So uh, let me show you that one. Um, if you go to Scholar and you type in AR, um, what you have to do is you actually have to go to Scholar Preferences. And in the bottom here, you can say Bibliography Manager, and you want to have everything in EndNote. But it will show, it essentially adds this field here, Import to EndNote. And that's how we can also get um, these files. However, the ones from Google Scholar are not as reliable and precise as the ones from the original publisher. So if you can get it from the publisher, it's better, usually. If you can't get it from the publisher, well, yeah, then this is your next best thing. OK, I was in the style section, and I downloaded, hopefully, something. So I hope that I can now do BibTeX. I hope I don't have to restart. Um, ah, wonderful. I don't. Nice. Now, so far so good. That is the reference manager and the reference styles. Now, before we go over to layout, there's one more thing, and that is um, figures. Of course, in your, in your uh, publications, you will produce figures. And the important thing is that if you do photographs, you know, there's no other way you will have bitmaps. That means you actually your, your figure will consist of pixels. Right? And that's unavoidable because that's the only way photographs work. Now, still what you should do is try to avoid a lot of JPEG compression. So every time you use JPEG, it actually reduces the quality of the photo. And if you like open a document as JPEG and save it again as JPEG, and open it as JPEG and save it as JPEG, every single time you do that, you lose quality. So if you want to have it really beautiful, what you do is you make it, you have your bitmap, you keep it in an uncompressed format, such as TIFF or PSD or, or such things. And only in the very end, you actually convert it into um, uh, a compressed format. The compressed format is essentially there that keeps the file size down. Now, Word, for example, can also directly uh, deal with PSD files. So from Photoshop, you know that works. They can also deal directly with TIFF files. It also works. It's just that your document gets bigger, uh, the file size gets bigger. In memory, it will always be the same. Just because your JPEG has a small file size only means that it's compressed when it is saved on the hard disk. But in your memory, in your RAM, it will take the exact same amount of space. So in that sense, if you think, OK, I'd rather put JPEG into my Word document because I don't want to use up so much memory of my computer, that's just wrong. It will use the exact same amount of memory. Okay? So then rather go for quality. As a rule of thumb, um, all of your pictures should have 300 dpi. 300 dpi means dots per inch. Um, and that essentially means how many pixels you will actually have. So for one inch of printing, you must have 300 pixels okay. as a rule of thumb. If you go below that, it will, not look, it will not look very good. However, since you're all scientists, you're probably going to have lots and lots of graphs. Right? You're going to have diagrams and lines and scatter plots and bar charts and all of these kind of things. These things you should never convert into a bitmap. Because when you print it, it looks so much worse. 
that you want to have is you want it to remain in a vector format. And a vector format is a something, um, uh, for example, like a PDF file. Be careful. A PDF file can also include a bitmap. It can also include pixels. Just because it's PDF doesn't make it, you know, vector, right? So um, the trick now is to always stay, uh, when you have vector as a starting point, make sure you keep it that way. In previous versions of Microsoft Word, it was really, really bad. Because what would happen is, like, even if you have a PDF file, and if you would input that into Word, and you zoom in, it still looks like, well, it's vector. But once you create a PDF file of that, Microsoft actually will turn it into a bitmap, and it looks bad. With Office 2011 for the Mac, that seems to have been resolved. So if you now export it, it actually remains to be a vector, which is good. But as I said before, you shouldn't actually import pictures or graphs or vectors or anything like that into Word. It's just going to make your life difficult. If you write something, and if you, for some reason, are forced to do it in Word, you cannot do it any other way, okay, then write in it, but leave all the figures out. When you're completely done, you've written everything, revised everything, everything is ready. Only then add the figures. Because Microsoft Word has a really bad reputation when it comes to uh, managing uh, figures. Right? So just don't do it. Keep it simple. Keep it only text. Only text, nothing but text. Then it works reasonably well. Now, um, here, for example, you have a, a, a simple graph um, you see. And the thing about vectors is if you zoom in, you know, it always remains crisp and sharp. Right? If you would do the same thing with a bitmap, you would start to see the pixels. Right? It's scalable. Because the vector means that all the shapes that are visible are stored in the form of mathematical formulas. And these are scalable. That's the beauty of it. Now, so that was figures. Then now we start to make uh, a big decision. And the big decision is the following. Am I going to use Word for the layout or not? Sometimes you don't have a choice. So for example, it could be that the conference on the journal only accepts Microsoft Word and nothing else. Well, then you don't have a choice, then you just have to stick with it and, and do it. Very often these places provide templates. So um, a conference would have a Word template and you're supposed to use it. Well, then use that template, of course. And uh, yeah, when there's no choice, there's no choice. If, however, they give you the opportunity to choose, or for example, if you're writing your own report or your thesis, then you have a choice. And then you can consider doing LaTeX. Personally, I came to the conclusion that it's a big time saver. You have a little bit of a learning curve, that you have to learn a couple of things. But once you learned it, it really saves an enormous amount of time. So, and it has been proven to be extremely stable, extremely reliable. So if you have a bigger project, if you make a 500 pages thesis, that's okay. It can handle it. Out of, I'm, I mean, this is kind of ironic because originally I have an, an education as in design and LaTeX is in a form, the kind of form of anti-design because you don't spend any time anymore with layouting because everything is automated. It is an automated layout system, right? And that actually is, is from a design perspective, very problematic because all designs become unemployed, right? Because there's no more need for them, right? Their need will actually be then to create the templates that LaTeX is doing. But it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to earn any money anymore and then like charging money from you and you and you and you to lay out your document, your document, your document, your document. It wouldn't work that way. I can only charge once for the one template I create and then all of you can use it. And then, yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's a very, very interesting system. Now, um, once you have this text and you want to move it over to LaTeX, that's quite possible. Um, uh, the one thing that you probably want to take in mind now is that uh, is the um, is the citations you want to kind of because the nice thing is that EndNote has the possibility of already formatting formatting it in uh, in BibTeX. So if you do that, you will see 
that BibTech adds here the um, um, where is it? Ah, okay. I know. BibTech requires that each reference has a label upon which it is called. So, and if you don't give it a label, it doesn't know what to do with any of this. Um, so, we also have mark in here. We also have to give mark a label. This paper has to have a Where's the label there? So, and now we try this whole thing again. Voila. And what you see here is something very important. LaTeX works similar as many other, let's say, uh, layout languages, so to speak. It works similar to HTML. So what you have is you've got plain text and then you've got tags in there. Right? That's essentially how LaTeX works. And here already you see a first tag, which is called the site tag. Right? And it's nice if you do this conversion already here, because then you can use the power event node to do all your citations, and you don't have to do it later on manually reinserting the references, because that's a little bit painful. Unfortunately, I haven't yet seen a way of, of doing the same thing for figures and table captions, so those things you have to do again yourself. Okay, so that's the preparation for LaTeX. And what you see, of course, then here in the bottom is also that this essentially is what will become um, um, the bibliography. And you can store it in an extra text file, which is kind of convenient. So, are we ready to say hello to LaTeX? Okay. LaTeX has been developed by computer scientists more than 20 years ago. And it's been under development ever since. And um, I guess, you know, see, computer scientists are really interesting. They're predominantly lazy. That means, you know, whenever there's a repetitive task, they, you know, try to find a way to automate it. And since the computer scientists had to write papers and papers and papers, they got really tired of it. And, you know, and they, well, you know, came up with a system that does the layout part automatically. Because this, this is something they don't necessarily like to do. They like to write the text, but they don't want to do the layout. Um, so uh, LaTeX itself only deals with text files, nothing else but text files. So even with a very normal, like simple text or text editor, you can do LaTeX. Because LaTeX is nothing else than ASCII text, nothing else. And all the editors around it just are comfort. So they make these things a little bit easier to use. Um, but you can even write LaTeX in, in Word. You, know, you just save this document as a text file, and there you go, you got LaTeX. Right? The only thing in the, the, the software itself, there's a software package, of course, in the back, which does the conversion, so that it converts your LaTeX file into, for example, a PDF file. And that is something you have to install. And my, uh, what you see is then that these kind of things are completely for free. Um, so if you're a Mac user, you would go to MacTech, and you get the whole package for free. If you're a Windows user, the same thing. Um, and then it's a question of, uh, there's the core system, which then is LaTeX, and then we are the, the editors on top of that. Right? Um, so for the Mac, there are two of them, for example, TextShop or um, uh, uh, TextMaker. Uh, for, for Windows, there's a very popular one, which is called MicTech. Um, so um, just to show you where it is, here you got MicTech. And uh, if you install this on your Windows machine, then you are pretty much done for, right? All for free, all ready to use. How wonderful is that? Now, I recently came across another text editor called um, Text Maker. And the one thing I kind of liked about it is that it's, for the Mac, it's better than the other one, which is TextShop. And the other thing is that it's platform independent. So if you, for example, if you work on, on Windows and Mac mixed, then it will always look the, exactly the same way, which kind of makes it nice. Um, and um, it has some nice features, so I kind of liked it. I have not yet worked with MicTech myself. It's, I know it's very popular. Um, so if you're a Windows user, you know, maybe you want to use TextMaker, maybe you want to use MicTech, whichever you choose. Um, I'm going to demonstrate now uh, TextMaker, but it doesn't really matter because 
the LaTeX inside will always be the exact same thing, no matter what editor you use. Right? Okay. So, text maker. So, shall we do a little report? So what we would do is we just make a new document, and there's a little wizard. Woohoo! So we want to write an article, and here we have the author is and want to evaluate really okay there you go I wrote my thesis and we save it let's say we put it on the desktop make a new direct oh. ah, interesting we make a new directory called uh, and we call it sticker zero one Okay, so there are actually some things in here we don't need even. I, there were actually these things we don't even need yet. So what you see is, is a very, very simple document, right? You see a document class, which kind of defines what kind of document it is. You have an author, you've got a title. Um, there's only one thing missing here, which is we have to actually tell it where it should make the title. Oh, sorry. Um, the title should go there. And now we're ready. So we now, oh, I should probably change that. It's going to be a bit easier. I'm sorry, I, this is still a, a new computer, so a lot of things are not set up yet. And what, there you go. There you have your PDF file. Done. Now, Maybe you wouldn't actually start with this sentence. Maybe you'd, for example, start with something like an abstract, right? So we would do a, um, a begin, and we would have an abstract, and we have an end abstract. I am really abstract. Uh, there's one too much here. OK, we got an abstract, and we got the first uh, a first sentence there. And of course, you wouldn't have an abstract. You would actually probably start with something like a section, right? So you would actually start with um, a section. And this maybe would be the introduction. There we go, introduction. And maybe we have a subsection. Um, so after this, we maybe have a subsection. Um, which we call um, background. There we have a subsection. Right? So the idea is that you separate your text from your layout. The layout is automized. You just tell it the structure of the document. You tell it this is a paragraph, this is a section. But you don't tell it in any way how it's supposed to look like. So in a way, it's a little bit like a style. You define that, OK, this is. You know, style defines, like for example, a headline. So in a way, it's similar, but it's all embedded here. Now, so far so good. So um, as you see, it is it, it is really really easy to do this, and it's just a text editor. Now, shall we do some um, some more things? Yeah. Shall we throw in a figure? Okay. Let's 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 do a couple of things. First, we maybe want to have a little bit more text, so it's kind of like nicely flows around it, right? So I'm going to steal a little bit of text around here. Oops. Um, right. And then now it's a little bit something. This is kind of an example of. Uh, something one has to get used to. Um, LaTeX only knows ASCII. It doesn't know a single special sign. So for example, if you have the smart quotes, it doesn't know that. Right? If you want to have smart quotes, because this is really, really, it's really just ASCII. You only have like 128 or 256 characters. That's it. Nothing else. 
of course, you can always extend it. So, okay. Um, yeah, let's do it. Um, since this thing has been around so long, there are thousands of people who made extensions for it. Right? So, for example, what, the, what would be you if you were Russian? You want to write something in Russian. Well, you can't represent Russian in ASCII, right? Because, you know, it's American, like Latin. Right? So it doesn't work. So, of course, there was a guy who figured out, made a package that actually becomes possible. So pretty much with anything that you want to do, you can do it. The only thing you have to do, you have to uh, define up front that you want to use a certain package. So let's do that. Um, we want to use the package. And this, for example, since we want to use a graphic now, it's the package called graphics. Okay. And since it doesn't now, here is a good example. So it has like the smart apostrophe. You know, that doesn't work. So what you have to do, you have to do just one time. Um, you have to do a search and replace and um, just make it uh, the dumb. Okay. So that should be it. Hopefully. Voila. Here we go. So uh, let's maybe make another. Oh, we're just going to use the same one since we already have it now anyway. So now we want to have a little bit of a graphics. So um, uh, we have it now on a, uh, let's, of course, we have to now give it, of course. Uh, I have pre prepared some graphics. So let's take here graph one. Okay, it's a little PDF file. Okay, so what we do is we uh, insert uh, a graphics. So, um, now, where was it? Uh, include graphics. There we go. So, we look for it. Oh, I already have it twice in here. Don't know why. And we want to give it a caption. This is my file. And you can place it, you know, here you can define how it should be placed, but I'm going to neglect that right now. Oh, that is correct. Uh, interesting, that would be interesting. Huh? Okay. Voila, that's it. So, let's run this whole thing. And here we go. And what you see, it's far too big, right? So we have to actually give it a scale. Um, let's do it with 0 0.2. There you go. Done. Now, let's go a bit further. Let's say, similar to Word, now we want to make a cross-reference to this. right? And what we need then is we have to give it a label. And we call it uh, my figure. Ah, let's just call it my figure. And then we just say C figure backslash ref my figure. There you go. Compile it, and there you go. Oh, interesting. See, we see now here some question marks. This is another speciality of, uh, of, of, of this kind of system is that um, um, it's a peculiarity. It has a very as a slightly more uh, um, uh, extended um, compiling process, sometimes you just have to do it twice and it works. Yeah. No, it. Um, to be to be honest, it looks to me just like a really, really, really user unfriendly solution. So the basic idea, it has a certain process of all the steps it goes through to compile certain things, and it has sort of like some in-between files it creates. Um, and sometimes you just have to run it twice, you know, just for, just because you have to. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I mean with the learning curve. You know, this kind of like user unfriendliness, you know, thing is, is still unfortunately a little bit there. <coughs> yes, uh, actually, a MIGTEC has a button which is Compile twice. <laughs> it's just because sometimes you want to compile for a dig as well. And so you right. want to run like can you play dig, 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 can you play dig, can you play dig? Exactly. So could you make it all happen in one step? Yes. 
it is possible. Also, in this editor, I haven't used it. I mean, I only started using this like three days ago. So I know that it has some custom commands that you have. Um, so you can actually uh, um, make commands here, but I haven't tried it out yet. But yes, you can. So now we have a graphics, which is already pretty nice. Uh, we've got, OK, now shall we do a little bit of citations? No? This is something you probably have to do every once in a while. And um, there's, of course, a command for that. So, bibliography, and we give it a, a style plane. And then, uh, oh, oh, sorry, this is bibliography style should be plane. And this one, we just have to give it where to find it. We're going to put it into um, an external file. Um, so now we had, in Word, we had this thing here, these two nice little, two little pieces of text. Can you document, throw it in here, call it dicker.bib. Bib is the name of the uh, bibliography, right? Throw it in there, so we got that. And now we only have to cite it. Right? So let's throw a citation in here. We make a citation, and I think it was called Mark 1. Something like this. Okay. And now comes the fun part with the bibliography. <laughs> I'm not sure if it does it the first time around. Probably not. Yeah, see, here's the uh, citation, but it's not done yet. I think I probably have to run bibliography separately once. No. No, it's still not there. Huh? Okay. So we actually have to um, uh, compile the, uh, the bibliography uh, separately. So we just hit bibtech, then we do it, and then we do it, voila. So as we see now, we see a one. Isn't that wonderful? And down here, we've got the reference. Now, that's all nice and good. Let's have some more fun. Um, and I'm going to now steal a little bit of things that I've done earlier. Because if the output is actually, um, um, is it in here? No. Um, oh, here we go. This one. No. Um, this one is a really nice. So since you're going to do PDF anyway, right? There are, PDF has a lot of nice features, and we want to utilize them. So for example, PDF has like the cross-reference. You can click on it. It has hyperlinks, right? You can click from a citation to the bibliography, right? And all these things is essentially uh, automized. So I'm going to throw it into here. And what this thing says is I want to use the package hyperref and I have PDF author. Um, and this is interesting because, you know, when you've got a PDF file, it has metadata in it, right? And this metadata is what I'm setting here. I'm setting the metadata of the PDF file to Christoph Bartnick. So I'm, and, and I'm giving a subject, the keywords. I want to have colorful links. I want to have bookmarks. And I want to determine how it actually should look like uh, when it's first opened. Oh. Now, what do I do now? Um, I did something. I'm missing Sorry? Are the commas missing when you finish the Yeah, interesting. I think so. But I worked in the other one. Voila. Okay. Now, now we have here the. Um, um, oh. On the desktop, we have now Christina's file, and here's the PDF file. Oh, no. Uh, this one. And what you see is that you have here, on the side here, you have now the same uh, uh, table of contents, which is always nice. And if you look into the, uh, into the, uh, um, no. Oh, here we go. Title, author, subject, it's all in here. Now, the reason why this is important is the following. If you would eventually put your PDF file online, 
and you want this to be picked up by Google. You know, the more metadata you have with it, the better, right? And the more of this metadata you fill in, the better it is. What you also see now is that this thing got green, so I now can click on it and shush, you know, I get to the references. And the same thing for the figure, you know, so you can jump around, right? All done automatically. <clears throat> okay, let's go a step further. We had um, um, uh, an index, right? We had this in Word. One command in LaTeX, make index. That's it. Oops. <laughs> I promised so much. <laughs> um, um, oh, what did I do wrong now? Um, uh, no. I think you can essentially put it wherever you want. Um, Not it. Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. Why is that not working? What does it say? Um, can only be used in the preamble. Ah, sorry. This is the. I think this is the wrong command that I used. Um, it's called table of contents. That's why it's called. It's called table of contents. One command. <laughs> Ta-ta. Contents. There you go. It um, doesn't have much in there yet. Um, probably because we don't really have much in it yet. Um, so let's do another section. Um, no, voila. Table of content and again clickable, right? So you can click on it and it will jump to it. Now. Um, since we now separated the style from the content, it is also very easy to change it, right? Because what would happen actually is that you would go to um, a conference website, like for example, um, um, let's see the Kai conference, okay, it's the 2010 version, and you see here the LaTeX template, right? Um, and the thing is now that they, in theory, the only thing you would have to change is here up front is the document class. And then essentially it would essentially do everything by itself. Now, as I said, with the, with the, uh, with the packages, they do, um, sometimes they use more packages. So it's not 100% that easy. So what you would get, for example, is that um, you will get something like this, which is now uh, the template from the Kai conference. And if you would now compile that, you would see it here, right? And then you would have essentially have to do a little bit more, like you know, uh, the uh, the author, and here's the author one, right? So that would be. So it's not completely copy and paste at least not for the upper part. See, there you go. But for starting from the, from the section part here, you can essentially copy and paste your stuff in, right? Because the section, subsection is all the same. Right? So it's very easy to, to move over from one template to another. So that saves, I suppose, a lot of time. Right. Now, I suppose this is uh, enough promotion for, for LaTeX. Again, I would strongly recommend that you use it. If you make a thesis or anything bigger, definitely do that. Now, we then move over to some other topics, and that is 
um, oh, you asked, somebody asked about the, um, the, um, the uh, file formats for graphics. I think you asked about the file format for the graphics. So this is something you have to keep in mind. Uh, LaTeX is old, so when it came out, essentially it could only process EPS and PS, and that's the original LaTeX compiling. These days, everybody's actually doing PTF LaTeX, and then you can use JPEG, PNG, and PDF. Those are the only three formats you can use. Well, that's good enough. Now, publication menus. So once you have your paper, the question is, where on earth am I going to submit it? And that's a difficult decision. Um, and these are pretty much your, your four options, and uh, with decreasing amount of value. So in the scientific community, there are certain standards, which are standards, social standards. You know. So for example, journals are being more esteemed as conferences. Conferences are being more esteemed than symposia, and symposia are being more esteemed than workshops. Now, it's a convention. It's a stand. It's not necessarily ground truth. You know, it could very well be that there's a very super nice special workshop, and you know, and what comes out of that is super, and and then that's that's the best thing that ever happened. You know, but if then later on you apply for a job somewhere and your professor say, oh, where did you publish? Oh, that was this super workshop. Workshop. You know, that, that can't be good. It's just a workshop. So it's to some degree a social convention. Um, the problem is a little bit ground truth. See, it used to be the following. It used to be in the old days that, um, uh, first of all, journals was pretty much the only way to publish, right? Because conference didn't have proceedings. There was so much effort to do the printing. The conference didn't have proceedings. So if you would go to a conference and you present something, then yeah, it would be heard by the people who are there, but there would be no record of it whatsoever. And only after some time and printing became better and, and cheaper, it actually started to make proceedings, right? Um, but that came later. Now, with journals then, there was, it was pretty straightforward. The idea was that the most popular journals, you know, would be the good journals. And if you would submit there and get something in there, then more people would be subscribed to that journal, which means, again, that you could have a wider audience because more people would have a chance to read it because more libraries would have actually have got that journal, right? Now, that is how the situation was approximately 20 years ago. Since then, with the arrival of the Internet, pretty much everything has changed. Because these days, the publishing part, in terms of making the knowledge available, is, is nothing anymore. You just put the paper on your own web page, and it's published. Right? So the, uh, the, the service that the publishers gave, namely duplication and distribution, has been vanished or taken over by the internet. So now it's no longer the issue in terms of, okay, if you publish in a good journal, more people will read it. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, the, the more people who read it, the more people have access to it. And those people, who are, when you have access to it, is, for example, open access. If you, if you can publish in the open access model, more people can see it. You've got a bigger audience. Who of you, in the last five years, went to a library and looked up an article in the library? One. Wow. How old was the article? Actually, not too old, but there were very specialized journals that people wanted yeah. access to. Now, sometimes you have it like articles from the 70s or so, and they haven't put them, scanned them yet. That's when you have to do that. But otherwise, why bother? Go to Google Scholar, go to another search engine, you get all the PDFs directly onto your desktop. Right? So it doesn't really matter anymore. Okay, technology has changed, people not. That means those people, you know, in your future career who make the decision to hire you or not are senior people, you know. And this, recently I talked to a, a, um, a dean of a, of, of a computer science department and they were talking about electronic publishing and one of the full professors, an old senior full professor, was strictly against any kind of electronic storing of PDFs because he said if it stored as a PDF, you know, people could copy it. You know, they haven't understood yet there's something like a scanner, you know, or something like a, you know, OCR software, you know. A lot of these old people just have not yet completely adapted to it. So the people, the technology changed quicker than the people. So even though these kind of ideas about the ranking or the importance of journals might be old-fashioned, 
you will still be confronted with it. You'll have the people who still believe that it's better to publish in a journal. May be right, may be wrong. It could very well be some other good reasons for it. It doesn't matter. Because the only thing is the people who make the decision to hire you are people. And the question is, what do they think? So in that sense, it's sometimes good to be a little bit conservative on this. Right? It doesn't make, might not make a lot of sense, but yeah, humans change very slowly. And societies also change slowly. So if you can, publish in journals. If you can't do that, go for conferences. Now, now you say the argument, yeah, but you know, when I go to a journal, it takes a year to get it published. If I go to a conference, that's a deadline. I, can, I need deadlines. If I don't have a deadline, I can't work. You know, don't get yourself into that. You know, if you got the good stuff, you know, go for a good journal. That works. That is, that is not a good idea. That is very simple, not a good idea. Because what you do is you get suddenly two papers that are very similar and they talk about the same thing. And then the question is, if I read papers and they are roughly the same, which one am I going to cite? Okay. And then there will be a little bit of randomness in there, you know? So half of the people will cite that paper and the other half cite that paper. And then essentially what you do with the citations you receive, you split them into two. Yeah, so it's, it's not good. But I will come about quantity and quality a little bit, a bit, a little bit later. Next question is like, okay, so how, how can I even know what is a good journal? How can I even know what is a good conference? Yeah, it's, a, it's a very tricky thing. Now, this is something that people have been bothered with a long time ago. So already in the 70s, um, um, they started working on this. And there's a guy who founded a company on it. Uh, the name escapes me now, but it's called ISI, who's then been bought up by Thomson Reuters. And they came up with a system called uh, Science Citation Index. And what they actually did is something what Google essentially picked up later. The idea is the following. Any paper or any journal that receives a lot of citations is probably a good journal. It's the Google algorithm, right? But way before Google, right? And then if you go to this website, Web of Science, um, actually it turns out that we have a subscription to the system. Um, oh, interesting. That's not good. That's bad. I was, I was there in the other day, in the other room, and there it worked just fine. Why do I have a different IP address now? Why is this not? Damn it, that's not good. Well, in theory, we have apps access to the service. And what it does, essentially, it lists all of, a lot of journals. Actually, it only lists something like 30% of the journals. Because when they started it, they did all of this by hand. So they got all the journals, and they actually looked at every paper, and they looked at what paper does it cite, and actually do it manually. Enormous amount of work, right? You couldn't do that, of course, for all the journals, because it's too much work. So what they said is like, okay, we know we're only going to the top 30%, because that's the only thing that matters anyway, right? And that's it. Um, and therefore, they're extremely selective. Now, this database then has been around for a long time, and it was the only way you could ever actually get quantitative access to this kind of data. And since, and since it was such a, say, well-maintained database, it became very popular. So a lot of studies actually are based on whatever is in this database. However, as I said, it's only 30%. There's barely any conference in there. In the recent year, they now also have something similar. They finally caught up to it and did something about conferences as well, but it's very selective. So it doesn't cover a lot of science, particularly not computer science. And there, there's a ranking in there, which is called the impact factor, which is based on citations. And that, if your journal has a high impact factor, you know, it's supposed to be good. Actually, to be in this database at all is already a sign for quality, right? So if you want to publish somewhere and you find it in, in this system, it's probably all right. I met people in other, from other disciplines, for example, physics, who clearly say if it's, the journal is not in this index, it's not worth reading. 
it changed a little bit from discipline to discipline, you know, but this is how far it can get. Now, there are other things. For example, what you can do is you can go, uh, the Australians um, did a ranking. Um, this one. So they went out and went all through all the journals and conferences and ranked them. And you can download essentially um, a journal ranking here and there's also a conference ranking. And they have an A, B, C, D kind of system. Um, the thing is that this is done by the Australians, so they have an emphasis on Australian interests. Not everything that we are interested in is in there, right? But, you know, it is a good start. So anything that's marked in here as an A or a star is probably pretty good. And so you can just get here the, the, the PDF, or I think they also have an Excel spreadsheet, and then you can just search for it. Um, what you can also do is that you can look at the publisher. Usually, if a commercial publisher commits itself to a journal, that means there's a financial interest there. They actually have to put money into this topic, and it's a financial risk they take, right? And they don't, they don't do that unless they're certain it's reasonably good. So, if you have something that's self-published, you know, it's probably not, not so, well, it's, it's, it, well, if you're with an established publisher, it's usually an indication that this could be an okay journal. These days, you've got a lot of those very, um, some people, John, uh, there's now open access is a really good idea, but there are some companies who jump onto it, like Hindavi and, and Bentham and some others, and they turn this into a business model. So the idea is that they publish anything, being a little bit cynical here, as long as you pay for it, right? And these kind of publishers also have not have a very good reputation, right? So the two, two big ones are, hmm? What are the two biggest commercial publishers? Springer, Springer and Elsevier. Right? And then you have essentially, for in our case, IEEE and ACM. Those are not, com they are commercial, but they are uh, owned by an association and not a company. So, yeah. So, and last thing you can do, of <coughs> course, is just ask your supervisor, because he has some experience and he might be able to advise you. Now, Quantity and quality. Of course, this is something you have to decide for yourself. If you're at the beginning of your career, the question is, well, am I going to, I've got this experiment now, this piece of work, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to make one big paper out of it, you know, and make it really good and submit it to one place? Or, for example, am I going to chop it up into three small papers? Or I start doing it, I got a first iteration, I submit it to a conference, and then, you know, I'll work a little bit more on it, and afterwards I send the same paper again to a journal or something like this. So there are different strategies you can do. In general, it's always a trade-off between quantity and quality. The only limiting factor in your scientific career is how many papers you can produce. There's no limitation in terms of publication venues or, or opportunities. Um, you know, the only limiting factor is how much you can work or are willing to work. That's it. So, in essence, the number of bullets you have is limited. Right? You can only produce that, much, that many studies and that many papers, and that's it. You cannot do any more. So it's important that you make every bullet count. Now, if you, for example, should decide that you say, okay, I, I do low quality, I do low quantity, then you're probably lazy. Oh, that's not good. Okay, if you produce a lot of quantity of but of low quality, then you're probably desperate. That means you figured out you'll never be a good researcher, but you know, you, you're supposed to publish five papers a year, so how am I going to do that, right? And there are so many conferences and journals that accept low quality papers. Anything I published, it's no problem to publish, right? It's not a challenge. You can't be proud of having published 100 papers. It's easy, no problem at all, right? Um, and if you cannot do anything better than that, well, that's the only thing you can do, but since if you want to make a career, then you can only hope that, you know, by the quantity of the papers, you might be able to convince. Now, if you do high quality but low quantity, you're probably a serious researcher. That means you have an emphasis on quality, that's what you do, and, well, yeah, it's only three papers instead of five papers a year, but those ones really are good. And, of course, if you're really good, you can win a Nobel Prize. My recommendation is don't waste any effort on crappy papers. 
It is absolutely worthless. It doesn't buy you anything. If you shoot out a little thing to, to a little workshop that nobody ever listens, or nobody's going to read those papers. Nobody's going to pay attention to it. Yes, your list will not, it will not be this long, but it will be a little bit longer, but so what? It doesn't really help you. You're much better off if the limited time you have, you put on producing quality instead of quantity. And don't slice it up. This is the problem that I mentioned before. If you slice it up, if you've got one study, for example, you break it into two parts, you know, and they're roughly the same, then, you know, well, you just receive citations, but they will be split out over, or split out over two papers, and then, you know, you'll not get as much out of it. Which brings us to the next point. How do you ever measure the, if you're a successful researcher? Okay, we made it already the one thing which publication count. The more papers you have, the better you are, right? Of course, it's not true because, as I said, producing many papers these days is no longer a challenge, right? So then you can say, okay, the more citations I receive, the better I am. Yeah, that might be true, but, you know, if you just produce a lot of papers, you know, eventually some of them, you know, get some citations and therefore, you know, it might work. So the actually even better one actually is called an impact factor. Uh, well, we'll come to that. So the first thing is, just producing papers easy, you know, just produce many of them, you know, nobody cares, you know, and you just have a lot of a long, meaningless list of publications. But if you want to attract citations, you have to do a little bit more. And what you have to do is that you have to make it accessible. You have to be visible, that people can actually notice and find it at all, right? And that means you must put it in a, the repository of your organization. If you can, with your publisher, make sure it's open access. Put it on your homepage. These days, Practically, none of the commercial publishers care. Theoretically, yes, but practically, no. So always put your PDF files on your web page. Um, and if you can, Springer and Elsevier have got these days open access uh, uh, options. You just give them some money and they you know, make it open. There you go. So it's all about making it accessible. You cannot make other people cite you. You can only convince them by the quality of your paper. But if they cannot find your paper, yeah. You never get anything. So the, the, the one thing you can do is make sure it's accessible. And make good papers. Now, impact factor. Uh, this is the other thing. Um, again, you've got these people who make the mistake, and that's the following. The assumption is if you publish in a, good, uh, in a journal which has a high impact factor, your paper must be good. And of course, that's wrong. It's a wrong conclusion. Um, because um, you know, people don't have time anymore to read papers, so they like to have numbers. Right? So if they can just look, okay, one paper in a journal which has like a 2.1 impact factor, well, you get 2.1 points for that. Very simple. But it's wrong, because it is not the journal that makes the paper, it is the papers that make the journal. Even in the best journal, you have, not every paper is equal, right? So you've, in every journal, you've got a couple of papers that receive a lot of citations, and many papers which barely receive any citations, right? It's not evenly distributed. So just because you are in a certain journal doesn't mean that the paper is good, right? It's a wrong conclusion. But some people are not completely up to date on this, and they make this mistake. H index. This is a nice thing, because it tries to balance quantity and quality. The idea is that you've got an H index of six if you have at least six papers that each at least received six citations. Now what this means is that it doesn't help you if you've got 20 paper, meaningless papers that nobody cites. It would never have an impact on your age factor. Right? The only thing that matters is that you have uh, papers that all receive good citations. That means you must make every paper count. Every bullet you shoot must be good. And that's how you get your age index up. The only thing you can do to manipulate that right now because it's so much effort to check this is self citations. So you see a graph with a little study to check that out. So the question is the following. What you can do is if you're smart, let's say, you've got an H index now, uh, what is this now, uh, like 19 or so. If you now cite with the 20th paper, so what you see is that, and this is a, um, maybe it's not clear, so no, I don't have a mouse, wonderful. Uh, the x-axis essentially is the, is the order of your papers. So you have essentially one paper by which has 31 uh, citations. You have uh, two pa a, a second paper which has that many citations and so forth. And there are two, two strategies here now. 
It's like one would be like you don't do anything about it, and the other one is you strategically place your self citations. So the idea is the following if you have a set, uh, an H index of six, you should never cite any paper that already has more than six citations because it's not going to increase your H index. So what you do is you cite that one single paper that is just needs one more citation to get a seven, and then you lift yourself up to seven. Right? And of course, your number of bullets is limited because you only have you know, X amount of papers. But what you can do is you can manipulate it. And this is what you see here. This hump here, this blue hump, is if you put this to the extreme. Like you always cite strategically. And now you know the, the blue line essentially is the is the age index, and you can see um, that the, the blue one is much higher the, than the red one. So the blue one has got a higher age index. So you can manipulate your age index through self citations. Other things you can do, some tips and tricks. The first thing is have a home page. If you don't have one, get one. Very good, very important, very easy to do. You must have a web page. Post your PDFs, I'd say. Second of all, post the, um, the citation files. For example, here's the BibTeX file. So on my, on my paper here, you see, um, I, can't see. Um, I have, for every paper, you can download the citation directly, similar to what we saw before at the publishers. So people can directly import this. The idea is make it as easy as possible for other people to cite you. You cannot make them do it, but you can make it easy for them. That's the only thing you can do. So make sure you don't only publish the paper, but with the paper, you put the citation there so people can download the BibTeX file directly, import it easily, and they don't have any troubles with that. Create an HTML version of it. Yes, a lot of people use Google Scholar, and Google Scholar has a preference for PDF files. But what you can do is that you, um, uh, a lot of people use just regular Scholar to search. And regular Scholar is not, is actually prefers HTML over PDF. And those people you can attract while also having an HTML version, because then, you know, they find your content. And then, of course, you have, you know, the PDF download available as well. Important, when you got the PDF file, A, uh, sometimes the PDF files don't actually have the complete citation in it. So even if you download the PDF file and you forgot where you got it from, it's really difficult to find it back where it actually was published. So in with Adobe Acrobat, you can actually add a header as marked here red. So I added this header to this PDF file on every page. So whoever downloads this PDF file knows where it came from and how it can be cited. Furthermore, oh, there's one missing. Oh, it's this one. Um, do the metadata. So every PDF file has metadata. Fill it in so that Google can find you better. If you have a home page, do, um, do WordPress, do site you like, do Mendeley, do YouTube, do Sivy. Essentially, shoot your stuff out there. Make sure it's accessible to other people. Now, review process. Once you've done that, a review process is difficult. It's difficult for everybody. Um, but the basic idea is never give up. Again, you only have a limited amount of bullets, right? So every paper you produce, you should make sure it gets published, right? And the way you do it is, it is something called the publishing letter. So what you do is that if you write a paper and you send it somewhere, and they, send, they say immediately, great, we publish it immediately, give it to us, you're done. Then probably you put, sold it too cheaply, right? So what you do is that you make a good guess in terms of, oh, probably at this quality level I might be able to get in, and then you go one step higher, right? You might get lucky. And then you get a rejection. And then you go to the next publication venue, submit it there, and you probably get a rejection. And then you go one down. And then, well, there you go in, and then you have it, right? takes a little bit more time, but that way you can ensure that you don't sell yourself too cheaply. And first you get, you get feedback. Exactly. You get sometimes good feedback. Every review that we receive is actually worthwhile. One of the major limiting factors these days is attention. How do you get, actually even get into, the, into the awareness or consciousness of other people? Very difficult. There's too much literature out there, too many papers. Nobody can read it. Right? So if you have anybody at all who spends time on reading your stuff and is even willing to give you some feedback, it's gold. And even if it's 
horrible, depressing with the things that they come back with. You can always learn something from it. So any kind of feedback you receive is gold. And you should be thankful for that. That means be polite, 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 polite. If you want to get something in, it comes together with a never give up. You know, you can always resubmit, you know, resubmit, you know, and they will say, okay, now you have to change that. You change that, you send it back. And they say, no, it's still not good. You do it again, you do it again, you do it again, and eventually they give up, right? But the point is, don't make them angry. If you come along and say, like, oh, you just didn't understand my stuff, you stupid idiot, you know, it doesn't work. Every time you should start your rebuttal saying, oh, we're so grateful, it's so great that you spend this time thinking about these things. And anything, if, even if they didn't understand something, it is still your mistake because you didn't write it clearly enough for them to understand. Right? So then you say, I'm sorry that uh, you know, I was not so clear on this. I will try to make it clearer to you now. Maybe it helps if I explain this. You know, you always be in a sort of like submissive uh, gesture and be polite, you know. I think one of the papers I did went to five cycles of reviews before it was eventually admitted. You know, it just happens. It takes time. But this is something else. But now you probably think about how can I make a lot of publications now because now I'm looking for a job and now I need to have a publication list. Your career is long. You know, if you stay in academia, you're going to be busy. Well, we know with the increasing number of years you have to work, you're going to probably be busy for another 60 years writing. Right? You've got 60 years ahead of you that you have to work. <laughs> so, don't waste time on meaningless papers. Write good things. Send it to good places. And, and then these kind of gems that you create will be with you for the rest of your career. Because no matter where you are, you may change your affiliation a couple of times. Your publications will always be attached to you. They can never be taken away from you. Your job, you might get fired. Yeah, that can happen. But they cannot take the publications away from you. Right? So this is something that stays with you. That's all for now. Any questions? Or comments, ideas, anything? I only use one reference manager, I only use EndNote. I just showed you many of them, just so that you get an impression of you know, what there is out there. Yeah. I use LaTeX, I use Mac. Well, I suppose it's time for coffee for all of us to wake up then. Eh? <laughs> Thank you.